Growing up in a place without a lot of cultural diversity is challenging. Um, for starters, you feel like an outsider all of the time, and you aren't really sure where you fit in. I'm Makita Rivas. I'm a writer based in Washington, D.C. Uh, originally, I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska, and I'm Filipina and Mexican. In the case of being multicultural, the struggle is kind of having one part of your identity um, attached to one culture and another part of your identity in another culture, and you never really feel totally whole. Um, and I always struggled with feeling like I was not Mexican enough or Filipina enough, especially because I didn't speak um, Spanish or Tagalog. I not only grew up in a place without a lot of cultural diversity, but I was, I didn't grow up in a very big family. I just had um, my parents and then an older half-brother who was 12 years older than me. So in many ways, I kind of grew up as an only child. I just didn't have a lot of um, you know, peers who were like me, um, who were my age and who maybe understood what it was like to have, you know, two parents who were immigrants from two totally different parts of the world. So there was just always kind of this, like, disconnect, I think, that I felt with um, those around me. Once I got to high school, and it was a public school, and there's no dress code, all of a sudden, like, it was a whole new world. But coinciding with that was all of the typical adolescent, you know, grief of, of just trying to fit in and make people like you. And I quickly noticed that one way to do that was through how I dressed. You know, just wearing the same mall brands that everybody was shopping at and the same logos and things like that. Looking back, the, those outfits are definitely not me. I wouldn't wear them today, but it was sort of a pathway to that sense of belonging. So there were just a lot of barriers um, that existed there for me to feel complete um, in terms of my cultural identity. But I wrote about going through what I describe as a chola phase, um, which, is, which is interesting to think about because at the time I didn't think it was a phase. Um, it was actually right around the time I was going through um, preparations for my quinceanera, so I was about to turn 15, and I just felt like I needed to be as Latina as possible and as Mexican as possible. And, and so I, you know, I saw some of like the Mexican kids at school and like how they were wearing big hoop earrings and um, red lipstick and, you know, channeling sort of that stereotypical um, chola look. And so I instantly identified that as like, oh, this is a way for me to belong. This is a way for me to, for me to prove, um, you know, that I'm Mexican enough or whatever. That's just one example of, of how I've gravitated um, toward fashion to provide me with a sense of identity. Fortunately now, you know, over, you know, 15-ish years later, um, I am at a place where I, I, it's the opposite. You know, I choose what I wear and my sense of style is defined by the life experiences I've had up to this point. And it's, it's less about reaching for trends or reaching for certain looks to provide that identity for me. That's one thing that I appreciate about Jane the Virgin. I, that's one of my favorite shows in general. I really admire the fashion because Jane is an everyday Latina. You know, she, she's not, um, a stereotype or um, a generalization through her fashion, you know, we get a sense of her just as a normal woman, albeit if you're familiar with the show, she goes through a lot of crazy situations, but um, she just has this approachability about her that I hadn't seen before um, with other Latina characters on TV. I think that fashion is a great entryway into heavier topics because fashion is approachable. It's something that we all put on every day, regardless of whether you consider yourself a very fashion-forward person. It's like we all wear clothes. And the fact of the matter is, is that fashion is political, something we're seeing um, a lot of lately when you look at the current socio-political landscape. 
you know, you have the first lady wearing a jacket that says, I really don't care to you. And, you know, that is a perfect example of when these two worlds intersect and how much um, of a conversation can come out of those two worlds sort of colliding. So I think it's important to recognize that fashion isn't this sort of superficial world that is relatively inconsequential. There is definitely a lot that's happening there um, that affects very serious things from politics um, and beyond. One of the first pieces that I ever published was after this election, I don't owe anyone my silence or unity. And it was a personal essay that they, um, that ran in bustle. And that was a, a big launching point um, for me. And I started to do more work for Bustle, and then that kind of led to other similar, like women's focused sites. And then it was Glamour, and then Teen Vogue, and, and so all of these um, opportunities have come my way, which was unexpected, but it's been really fun. I just feel really proud um, of the unique story that I get to tell. And we all have that whatever it is. I think for me, my, my multiculturalism is a big part of that, but for other people, it could be other aspects of their lives. Um, but if anything, I just feel so happy and proud that it's something that I can um, be an advocate for. I think it's really easy as a black woman to feel alone in astronomy, uh, or it would be easy, but I don't, I don't want to take the easy path. So I, I could kind of victimize myself and be like, oh, woe is me, I'm one of maybe 150 black women in this field. Or I could choose to you know, become close to my other astronomers, to my fellow astronomers, because we have this common interest in astronomy and at the same time recognize that I'm in this great position to be an example for young women of color who can look at me and realize that being an astronomer is something that's possible for them. My name is Moya McTeer, and uh, my, my mom is white, just like a, a mix of white that I, I don't even know where her family came from. I don't think she knows. And my, my birth father's family originally came from Haiti, I think, as far back as we can trace it. But I don't know more than that. My mom has always wanted me to be a scientist. So she was an adjunct English professor when I was growing up, which means she had basically no money. There were summers when she had to work at like the local grocery store, even though she had a PhD, uh, and she still didn't make enough money, and sometimes we couldn't afford things like toilet paper, or you know, just like basic essentials. And she really didn't want that life for me. And in her mind, the, the way for me to escape that was to get a job in STEM, either be a, a doctor or an engineer, because that's, those are jobs that make good money. And so she, she you know, would do things like buy me telescopes or microscopes when I was really young. She would ask me algebra problems in the car. Uh, we called them X problems. And so I was mentally solving algebra problems when I was, I don't know, like four. Uh, because she just really wanted this life for me. After my parents got divorced when I was five, I lived with my mom uh, for a year in Pittsburgh, and then she met someone and fell in love, and we both moved to this very rural part of Pennsylvania. Uh, and so this person that I now think of as my dad, his name is Jim, and he is also very white. He was born in California. He's this like long-haired, hippie dude. Uh, he bought a log cabin in Pennsylvania that had running water, and then he ripped out the plumbing system and replaced the toilet with a composting toilet, and I think that says a lot about who he is. I understand that my upbringing was pretty non-traditional. Growing up in a log cabin in the middle of the woods without running water is not something that most kids can lay claim to, but you know, that's who my parents were when I was growing up, so I was uh, like a visibly not white person. Uh, who was being picked up from school events by white parents. And so I think that confused a lot of the people around me and they didn't really know how to deal with that. But it definitely 
added to my whiteness in a way that was advantageous to me uh, because I, I grew up around, I grew up with two white parents, so I knew how to exist in white spaces, and that makes me more palatable, I think, to white people. Going from my high school to college was a huge culture shock. So I, I went to high school in this very rural area where I was one of the only people of color in the entire town. Everything I knew about being black came from those few people, so like my father's family and the media. And when you grow up with that limited example pool, you, you associate blackness with a very specific type of person. They're just like stereotypes that are associated with black people, and so that's all that I, that I knew. Basically everything I had to scream to the world, like, hey, look, I'm a black woman, was my hair. Uh, because that's around the time that I started learning how to take care of it and present it in its natural state. Uh, then I went to college at Harvard in Boston, where suddenly I was surrounded by people of color. My freshman year roommate, one of them was another black woman. And so I was suddenly surrounded by more people of color than I had ever seen in one place in my life before, and it was great. I lived like that for a, a, about a year, until I started noticing things around me to tell me that you know, life for people of color is still hard when you live in the city. Um, I noticed that racism just became more subtle. My freshman dorm was right across the street from the folklore and mythology department, so I went to some of their events where they always had tea and cookies and everyone was really nice. Uh, and I had always loved reading fantasy books as a kid, and I was super into Greek mythology. So I decided to major in folklore. And my mom was so angry. Uh, we actually didn't talk for a few months because she, she wanted me to be a scientist. She had groomed me for most of my life to be a scientist and be an engineer. After a few months of not talking to my mom, I realized I, I need my mother. I'm a freshman in college in a totally new city, in a totally new environment and I decided to study a science basically to appease her. And one of my friends dragged me to an astronomy course, an introductory astronomy course, and the professor said that she would give us pizza every week, so I stayed, I registered for the course, and by the end of the semester, I was in love with the subject. If you don't see it, then you don't know that it's possible. So I don't, I don't know if I ever thought of my decision whether or not to be a scientist as racialized because my mom wanted me to be a scientist and that was totally independent of my race. It wasn't until I actually got into the sciences and realized how few women, how few people of color and how basically non-existent black women are in this field that I started thinking about access to science in a racialized way. I look at my my white colleagues, my male colleagues, and they can focus on the science. Uh, you know, I'm sure that they have their own lives going on, their own issues, but for the most part, they can be just like an astronomer. I have no choice but to be a black woman astronomer. I grew up watching Star Trek. My mom absolutely loved all of the different series. Belana Torres is an engineer on Voyager. She eventually becomes the head engineer of the ship, I think, but she's half human, half Klingon. Klingons are, I think, like a very loose analogy or metaphor for black people. And so the actress who plays Belana Torres is a biracial woman, but on the show she plays a bi-species person. And I absolutely loved having her as an example to look to growing up uh, because not only is she a biracial woman who is in this really technically difficult field and she's you know, crushing it, but she got there in such a non-traditional way. Uh, and so she is a great example for people who look like us and want to have technical careers. I'm at any given time mentoring, I don't know, a handful of other women of color who are younger than me who want to succeed in this field. I have to be on different committees and be parts of different organizations that are trying to make astronomy more equitable for underrepresented minorities because there just aren't that many of us to share that workload. Last year I taught my first undergrad astronomy lab. Uh, it was for non-astronomy majors and uh, we met you know, for three hours every week. 
And I realized looking at the labs that people had written before that most of them were, you know, they, they took you through really long calculations or they made you put things in the black boxes of code. And I, I realized that none of that was useful for people who didn't want to be scientists. So I developed my own curriculum where I focused on scientific skills that I think people could use in any career, whether they go into journalism or, or filmmaking. After seeing the way that it affected the students by the end of the semester, I realized that this is something that a lot of people could use. So if you had asked me what my long-term professional goals were a year ago, I probably would have said, oh, I want to be the next Neil deGrasse Tyson. I want to you know, like have a TV show or have a radio show or something where I teach people science. But now, I want to teach people how to think like scientists. I love science and the way that it forces people to be curious in a creative way and the way that scientists are good at generating new knowledge. I love that and so I think that my mom's foundation, you know, her grooming me to be a scientist meant that I was going to become a scientist no matter what. The, the field was just kind of random and a matter of chance. I'm Tanya Hernandez, and I am an Afro-Puerto Rican mixed-race woman. I am a lawyer and a law professor. I like to call myself an activist scholar. For me, what it embodies is the way in which when I am immersed in writing about issues of law, that it is not solely for an academic purpose. I grew up in New York City. Um, with my mom in the 1970s in uh, Midtown Manhattan in a neighborhood that then was called Hell's Kitchen. What was very formative for me about those years um, were the ways in which even though we were a community of predominantly of Latinos, uh, the belief was that we were superior from a race perspective because the notion was that we were race mixed and thus impervious to any forms of racism. My particular perspectives as someone who grew up in New York City uh, and could see how even in the midst of a multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, metropolitan, sophisticated uh, location that you could still have embedded issues of racism uh, and hierarchy and privilege that needed to be attended to. I have definitely experienced racism. One of my earliest memories of skin color bias being targeted at me uh, was about at the age of eight uh, when I had a pen pal assigned to me from the Scholastic Reading Program. Uh, and it was a young lady who lived in uh, the rural parts of Pennsylvania. And for we'd exchanged letters for quite some time. And there came a moment where she wanted for us to exchange photographs. She had a lovely face, white with long brown hair, very sweet smile. Uh, and then finally when my photograph arrived, I sent it to the mail for, to her, and then the letters stopped. There's no more exchanges of letters. Uh, and I remember talking to my mom about it, like, you know, what do you think is going on here? And I could see that it was painful for her. And it's almost in her reaction to it that I realized how significant it was that this young lady had stopped writing me. It was still a real strong indicator that even though she knew that my last name was Hernandez, uh, that the Hernandez part wasn't what she was rejecting, since Hernandez had been writing her letters for quite some time now, um, but it was the brown face that she got in that photograph that was the end to the exchange. And that has stayed with me all these years. You know, a lot of my work is about um, the ways in which uh, ethnic discrimination is relevant in the world. To talk about the way Latinos are discriminated against is important, but the Afro-Latino experience is not quite the same as a Latino who um, can move about and be you know, mistaken for a Spaniard. It's not quite the same thing as being mistaken for someone from Senegal. Right? We don't were not received in the same way, unfortunately, um, because of issues of racism. My first book was 
on this issue itself. I called it racial subordination in Latin America. I was in college, and so I studied in Brazil and in the Northeast in a place called Bahia, Salvador Bahia, which is thought to be the heart of blackness <laughs> within Brazil. That experience of living in Brazil uh, as a foreign exchange student was really quite informative to me because I could see the ways in which uh, my blue passport, my U.S. passport and uh, status and English speaking uh, dominance provided me with a particular kind of privilege vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afro-Brazilians and um, uh, others in, in the country. But if I didn't open my mouth or I said, not too much in Portuguese before my English accent would uh, be noticeable. I didn't get the benefit of the blue passport. Uh, I instead was provided with a indigenous native reception. That is to say, I was treated like Afro-Brazilian trash. I also look at this from the perspective of U.S. specific uh, law, uh, so that the, my latest examination is in the ways in which people who identify as mixed race, or multiracial, biracial, how they are treated and received uh, in courts when they bring claims of discrimination. There have been changes in the way in which anti-discrimination law uh, has evolved over the last few decades, since, let's say, 1964, uh, when the Civil Rights Act uh, was first implemented. Um, but the changes have not been ones that have targeted any single group. A more and more conservative um, judiciary has decided to limit more and more the scope of what counts as racism, what counts as discrimination, uh, and how much proof. That is to say, a, a growing belief that our 1964 body of law uh, no longer is modern enough right, to deal with a growing demographic of people who don't identify solely with one single race. My own examination of the cases, though, shows that that's actually not the case. I mean, it has an intuitive appeal, right? This idea that if you don't identify one way or the other, that a judge may not understand it and may misunderstand what's going on and not give you adequate protection under law. Um, but when I looked at the cases, what I saw was that while someone might be different today by saying that I don't identify with one race, I'm multiracial. When they describe what happened to them, it is a straight up old fashioned story of bias against non-whiteness. In my book, Multiracials and Civil Rights, uh, one of the main objectives of the book is to be able to uh, intervene into this conversation that sees the growth of a mixed race population as the end of all race problems <laughs> and to better articulate what are the real problems that we have going forward. White privilege, white supremacy, regardless of how many white identified people are in our population. In the years that I've been teaching, and now for at least a decade at Fordham University School of Law, it's always been very important to me uh, for my students to be exposed to two different things with regards to issues of race. One, that they have a firm understanding of what the uh, principles are of civil rights jurisprudence, you know, what, what equality law is, um, but also a deep understanding of the ways in which there are limits that they need to push up beyond, right? to not just accept law as is, but to be part of, you know, the change. I do have the blessing, though, that the race-based courses tend to attract many more students of color. So meaning, I will have this wonderful array uh, of students from different racial backgrounds, gender, gender identity, um, because they know that that's going to be a safe space. My choice to uh, write about race, to teach about race, uh, is not one that makes my life comfortable. <laughs> uh, it can be very draining work. Luckily, I've got a community of people uh, that support me, um, and I support them. But the real thing that keeps me going <laughs> uh, to do it day in and day out uh, is that I have children. And I want for my children to have a better world, and for their children to have a better world, and everybody else's children to have a better world. I want for the book to be able to be a concrete sharing of the 
actual stories of mixed race people who experience discrimination and have that be an indicator of how much we all need to band together to combat issues of racial privilege and hierarchy as opposed to viewing each of our own racial identities as so particular and unique that we can't be well serviced by civil rights law together.